Okay, it's working. Lo and behold. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Sorry for the delay. Um, it, I just, I guess if I'm going to use this thing, I need to come here five minutes early and mess around with it if I'm going to get the computer to work. Um, okay, first things first, first, just an administrative comment. Um, I sent an email out to everyone in this class in principle. Um, did everyone get that email? Okay, if you did not get that email, that means that uh, you are not an officially registered student as of Wednesday or whenever it was I sent the email. So if you did not get an email from me about this class, uh, let me know. Um, because that either means that you're not checking your email uh, or you're uh, not officially registered in some way. Okay, uh, so let me know so that I can add your name to the email list. Um, the other comment, uh, let's schedule the midterm. So I thought we could have the midterm on Monday, October 22nd. Does anyone have a significant problem with that? Where significant does not mean you don't want to take a midterm. Significant means another midterm on that day, for example. Okay. I mean, we could also do it the Friday before. I mean, I don't, would, how many people would prefer to do it the Friday before? How many people, okay, raise your hands high, high, high. Okay, how many, whereas how many people would prefer to do it that Monday? Okay, let's just do it that Monday. It seems like, uh, sorry, okay. Um, it seems like there were a few more people voting for the midterm on Monday, October 22nd. Okay, in class. Um, and as the date approaches, I'll give you more information about it. But for now, it's distant future. You could be dead by then. Don't worry about it. Okay. Let's continue with our discussion of special relativity. So I would like to start by just reminding you of the two basic uh, principles from which one can derive all of the interesting uh, physical consequences of the theory of special relativity. The first is uh, the general principle of relativity, which is that absolute velocities do not matter, only relative velocities matter. So, for example, if I were to perform an experiment in this classroom and obtain some outcome from this experiment, then I could take this classroom and put it on a train which is moving at 100 kilometers an hour and I could perform the same experiment and I would get the same result. There would be no way for me in a laboratory in a closed environment to determine my absolute velocity. Only relative velocities matter. And uh, relativity is a feature of Newtonian physics in particular because of the Galilean invariance of Newtonian physics. But uh, it is also in contrast with the second uh, fact about physics that we introduced last time, namely that the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. Namely, it is the same to all observers. Now, uh, this is in contrast, uh, at least naively, with the first principle. Because I could imagine that I have a flashlight here and I could shine the flashlight against the wall and you could measure how long it takes the flashlight to get the light to get from me to the wall, which would be something like, you know, uh, 15 or 20 nanoseconds. And then you could do another experiment where I'm in a train and I'm moving very rapidly to my right, for example. And then you would observe that the light would appear to be uh, faster from your point of view because it would be given by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second plus whatever my relative velocity is on the train compared to yours. But according to Maxwell's equations, that is not in fact how the world works. Uh, if I shine a flashlight on the train, then I will observe that light to travel at the speed of light and you will observe that light to travel at the speed of light independent of our relative velocity. And this is a, a quite radical departure from Newtonian physics. But in fact, it is a fact about the world, which is not just a theoretical consequence of Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations, but is in fact a true fact about the way the world works. 
And later on, at the end of this class, I'm going to be reviewing a bit of the experimental and observational evidence for special relativity, where I'll tell you about some of the experiments that have been done to test this fact. But before doing so, I just want to go through some of the basic consequences of these two facts. So uh, let me just remind you of the first consequence, which is that of time dilation, which we went through near the end of class last time. And the idea of time dilation can be understood very simply by just imagining that we construct the following very simple clock where we have a pair of mirrors and light bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. And I measure time intervals by measuring, by counting how many times the light bounces back and forth between these mirrors. So each tick of the clock just like the tick of a second hand on a watch, although nobody has uh, uh, mechanical watches anymore. Um, each tick of the clock is defined to be the amount of time it takes for the light to get from one mirror to the other and then back again. So one tick of the clock is then the, twice the distance between the mirrors, which I'll call L, divided by the speed of light. And in order to understand time dilation, I'll just review that calculation very quickly for you because it was a, a short uh, but nice calculation, is we just imagine building two of these clocks, which are identical in every way, except that one of them is going to be at rest with respect to us, and the other will be moving with some relative velocity. And so one can then imagine how we would measure the time interval between the ticks of this moving clock. So we have this one clock here, which is stationary, which is not moving. But the other clock, would, the light would be emitted from the lower mirror at some time t1, received by the upper mirror at some time t2, and then return to the original mirror at some time t3. And one can then calculate these time intervals in terms of the distance d that this clock has moved in between the emission of the light from the lower mirror and the receipt of the light at the upper mirror. And so uh, by definition, T2 minus T1 is the distance that the light travels, namely L squared plus D squared divided by C, because light travels at the speed of light. Whereas also the distance is equal to the velocity times the amount of time it takes the light to get the, the between the emission of the light from the bottom mirror and the receipt of the light at the top mirror. And so one can combine those two equations to derive an equation for T1 minus T2. It's very simple. You just plug the lower expression for D into the top expression for T1 minus T2 and solve for T2 minus T1. And this is what we went through last time. It's L over C divided by the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. So that uh, a tick of the, of the second clock will be longer than a tick of the first clock by a factor of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And that's a factor that occurs so frequently in special relativity that we give it a name. We call it gamma. And because of the principle of relativity, this will apply not just for clocks that are built out of mirrors with light bouncing between them, but for any sort of clock. And indeed, for any two events, for any pair of events, which are separated by a time interval, uh, let's call it delta T1 
in their rest frame, namely in the frame where they both appear to be motionless, will appear to be separated by a time gamma delta T1 in a frame where they are moving. And since gamma delta, one, delta T1 is greater than delta T1, just because 1 minus V squared over C squared is less than 1, so its inverse is greater than 1, this is referred to as time dilation. And it is one of the most basic and important effects in special relativity. So I should make one point, which is that um, from the point of view of the clock which is at rest, the clock which is in motion appears to be going slower. So from clock one's point of view, clock two is slower. But remember that just as clock two is moving to the right with the speed v from the point of view of clock one, clock one is moving with the speed minus v, that is to say, to the left with the speed v uh, from the point of view of clock two. And so, by the principle of relativity, there's no difference, there's no absolute uh, notion of velocity, only relative velocities. And so that means that from clock two's point of view, clock one is going to be the one that is slower. So from clock two's point of view, clock one is slower. To understand this, all we have to do is just imagine doing the same calculation again. But now let's do this calculation where I'm moving along with clock two. So we just have to think about this calculation where I'm moving along with clock two, so I'm moving to the right with a velocity v. That means that clock one is moving to the left with a velocity v. And so I do this exact same calculation, and I find that clock one is now slower than clock two. So not only is the rate at which a clock ticks not an invariant notion in special relativity, there's not even an invariant notion of one clock ticking faster than the other. So whether clock one or clock two ticks faster depends on who is doing the observation of the ticking. So in fact, this is an indication of a second of the important features of special relativity, which is the relativity of simultaneity. So the relativity of simultaneity is the statement that the ordering of events in time depends on which frame on the frame in which they are measured for example in the above example we could imagine that i am in the frame where i am at rest with respect to clock one, so that, for example, clock one does not appear to be in motion. And then if both clock one and clock two tick once at a given time, then clock one will tick again before clock two. So the ticks of the second tick of clock one would occur before the second tick of clock two. 
So there are two events, namely the ticks of this clock, which appear to be ordered to me. One of them happens before the other. Clock one ticks before clock two. Whereas if I am moving along in a frame which is at rest with respect to clock two, then I would see the exact opposite thing happening, that the second tick of clock two would happen before the second tick of clock one. I mean, this is very remarkable. Usually in uh, physics as in life, we think of events occurring in time as having a particular order, but actually, according to the theory of special relativity, there is no absolute ordering of different events. Whether one event happens before another event depends on who is observing those events. It depends on exactly how you are measuring which event happens correctly, what hap uh, happens uh, first. So um, this is not to say, I mean, at first sight, it seems like it would imp be impossible to do physics in a world where you can't decide which event happens before another one. Because among the other, other things that we like to base our physical rules on is the principle of causality, namely that one event will cause another event. But as we will see later on in this course, even though the ordering of events in time depends on the frame in which they are measured, there is still a notion of causality in special relativity. And it turns out to be a perfectly good notion of causality, which we can use to do all of the physics that we are used to. So despite this, there is still a notion of causality And it is, it is possible to say, in some cases, that one event will happen before another. But the point is that it is not always possible to say with definiteness that one event will occur before another. And so uh, next week, we'll dive into this uh, idea in much greater detail. I should also point out that there is another observer for whom the two ticks of the clocks one and two will happen simultaneously. Okay. Here's an exercise. Can anyone tell me what that observer is? How is that observer is moving? Yes. That's the relative velocity of those two. Precisely. Examples. Precisely. So an observer for which uh, the two clocks are both receding away, one to the left, and the other to the right at velocity v over 2 will, of course, see the two ticks of the clocks as happening simultaneously. And that is the origin of the phrase relativity of simultaneity. Um, but of course, both of those talks, clocks will tick slower by uh, an appropriate gamma factor than a clock which would be at rest in that observer's frame. So we've learned about two of the three basic effects of special relativity, the effects of time dilation and relativity of simultaneity. And I would now like to present to you the third classic effect, namely that of length contraction, but before I do so, let me pause and see if there are questions. It takes a little while to wrap your head around this stuff. So uh, uh, one of the things that I'm going to do today is derive all these in one way. And then uh, starting next class, I'll derive them all again in a slightly more abstract uh, way, which will allow us to think more deeply about what this means for space and time. But yes, there's a question. Um, in dilation, in uh, in this side motion, uh, the velocity is uh, in units with respect to it. Does this also affect uh, scalar motions? Scalar. Uh, 
Um, good, good. Okay. Um, when you talk about, when you use the word scalar, that's a loaded term. And so, um, you know, there, so here I'm talking about the measurement of time intervals. Um, when we talk, there are other intervals that will change as well, lengths as we're going to see right now. Also, velocities as measured in a different frame change. Um, we'll see that next class. Um, and also, all sorts of other quantities change as well. Um, and so when you say the word scalar, you're referring to a particular way that things transform. Um, and so let's get, we'll burn, let's burn that bridge when we come to it. Okay, so at this point I'm not, why don't you wait a couple lectures and if I haven't sufficiently answered your question, ask it again. Okay. So other questions? Okay. So let's now consider a slightly different thought experiment. So, so far in the example that I drew above, I had these two clocks, you can see them there. And they were both oriented perpendicular to the direction of motion. So they lay, the length of the clock on which the light was bouncing was oriented perpendicular to the direction of motion. So let's now ask what happens if we turn the moving clock on its side. so that it is parallel with the direction of motion. So um, indeed, the question that we would like to ask is, is the length of that clock, the, the distance between the two mirrors, in the frame which is moving, that is to say what I'll call L prime, equal to L. And you can already guess, I wouldn't be presenting this if the answer were yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and understand that. So here's the basic setup. So now at time t1, I have this clock which is oriented parallel to the direction of motion. So the distance between the two mirrors is given by L prime. Um, and uh, at time T1, the light will leave the left-hand mirror, and it will be received at the right-hand mirror at some later time T2, at which point it will bounce back and be received back at the right hand mirror left hand mirror again at some time t3 is the setup clear to everyone yes it's only moving sideways right it's not it's not also moving down it's moving sideways now so this cl this clock is moving with some velocity v to the right and i'm standing here watching this clock move with this velocity v so let's now imagine calculating the distance d1, which is the distance that the light will travel between its emission from the mirror at time t1 and its receipt at the right-hand mirror at time t2. So what is d1? Well, d1 is the distance between the two mirrors. L prime, plus the velocity of the mirror times the amount of time it takes between the emission and the receipt of the light. That's just the statement that this distance, d1, is the distance between the two mirrors plus the distance that the mirror travels in the time interval t1 minus t2. But d1 is also C times T2 minus T1, right? Because D1 is defined to be the distance that it travels between times T1 and T2. And uh, time and light travels at the speed of light. 
So this distance d1 is the speed of light times the amount of time it takes between time intervals t1 and t2. And so one could go ahead and take that second equation for d1 as c t2 minus t1, view that as an equation for t2 minus t1, and plug it back into the first equation. And you would get d1 is equal to L plus V over C times d1, or d1 is equal to L prime, sorry, L prime over 1 minus V over C. So that's what d1 is. Let's now calculate d2, where d2 is the amount of distance that the light has to travel between the time interval t2 minus t3. So the calculation is almost identical. So d2 is L prime now minus v times t3 minus t2. Why? Because d2 is the distance between the two mirrors minus the distance that the mirrors have traveled between the emission of the light at time t2 and its receipt at time t3. But also because uh, d2 is measuring the distance traveled as this light travels at the speed of light, d2 is going to be the speed of light times the amount of time it takes between these two events, which again, one can solve for d2. And just as before, it's going to be L prime, but now L prime over 1 plus V over C instead of 1 minus V over C. So if we were to compute the total amount of time it takes for the light to be emitted bounce off the mirror, and then receive back on the mirror at the left, it will be d1 plus d2 divided by the speed of light, which is, what is that? That is L prime over C times 1 over 1 minus V over C plus 1 over 1 plus V over C. I can then go ahead and uh, add those two together. So 1 over 1 minus V over C is 1 plus V over C over 1 minus V squared over C squared. And likewise, the second term is 1 minus V over C over 1 minus V squared over C squared, which if you add them together is 2 L prime over C times 1 over 1 minus V squared over C squared. So this is from my point of view here at rest, the total amount of time it takes for this top clock to tick. As written in terms of the distance between the two mirrors from my point of view here at rest, where the clock is moving with some speed v. But remember that I have my own clock in this frame, which is ticking once per time interval 2L over C, not 2L prime over C. And so if I wanted to compare the way that a clock which is moving oriented horizontally would tick compared to a clock that's oriented vertically, a clock that is moving that is oriented vertically would tick once per time 2L over C times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, which, if I combine that together, tells us that L prime is L times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Let me say that again, because I've actually just used a bit of a subtle argument. So what I did is I computed t3 minus t1, which is the amount of time it takes this clock to tick, uh, a clock that is a, uh, oriented parallel to the direction of motion. And I've compared that to the amount of time it would take a clock to tick oriented perpendicular to the direction of motion. And the amount of time it would take the clock to tick perpendicular to the direction of motion is given by the time dilation formula, 
So 2L over C is the amount of time it would take the click to the top clock to tick in a frame where it's at rest. And 2L over C times 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared is the amount of time it would take the clock to tick in the frame where it's moving. If the clock is, and so from that, we can derive the relationship between a length as measured in a frame where the clock is at rest and a length as measured where the, uh, in the, where the clock is in motion. And this is the basic, uh, feature of special relativity known as, le as length contraction, which is that two objects which are separated by a distance L in their rest frame will appear to be separated by a distance L over gamma, which is less than L, where gamma is that scale factor, 1 over the square root of v squared minus c squared, in a frame or to an observer that is moving with relative velocity v. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so isn't the time interval for both the same? The time interval for the both is different because there's a minus sign that comes in here. Okay, check out that. Oh, sorry, I see what you mean. Um, uh, yeah, the time interval. So, so well, actually, no, the time interval is not the same because, you, yeah. No, but like in the drawing, let's say we made the we made C1, C2, C3 so that there is. No, but remember this mirror is moving. Yeah. Okay. So if the mirror were oriented perpendicular to the direction of motion, then T1, T2 minus T1 is the same as T3 minus T2. Okay. Um, that is something that, that was in the previous example. But now if the mirror is oriented parallel, you have to take into account the fact that, yeah, uh, um, which is that the ends of the mirrors are moving at the, as this is going on. And so, indeed, uh, T3 minus T2 is not the same as T1, T2 minus T1. And it's basically because there's a minus sign right here, as opposed to a plus sign right, right, right up there. Okay. And I didn't actually go ahead and calculate T2 minus T1 for you uh, using this formula, but we could go ahead and do it. Okay. How would you do it? Well, you want to calculate T2 minus T1, just take this formula and set it equal to that formula, Solve for T2 minus T1 in terms of L prime. And compare it to what you would get by doing the same thing for D2. And you would solve for T3 minus T2. And because of that difference in sign, the plus versus the minus, you'll get a slightly different answer. I mean, it looks the same. It looks similar, but it's slightly different. Good question. Other questions? Yes? Right. Good. A absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. In the frame where this this clock is at rest, T3 minus T2 is equal to T2 minus T1. Well, um, what it means, and this is an important lesson, what it means is that, in, I mean, this is something that we will encounter again and again, which is that in order to understand physics from the point of view of different reference frames. In order to understand everything correctly, um, uh, it is usually the case that, the, uh, that all three of these effects need to be taken into account at the same time. So all of these effects must be taken into account 
So um, to put it another way, I could describe the experiment that I did above, the thought experiment that I did above, as a, a sequence of events. There's one event where the light is emitted for, at T1 and then received at T2, and then a third event where it's finally received at T3. And when I describe that event from my frame where I see this clock is moving, then I see that there is some sort of length contraction. Okay. But in order for that to be consistent with the physical, uh, the, with the physics of what someone in that frame would see, that person would have to take into account not just length contraction, but also time dilation. So we're going to go through a series of examples, and you will go through many examples on the problem sets, where you'll get a lot of practice for doing this. But for example, um, you know, whenever you consider uh, things of this sort, um, we need to be careful to take into account all of the effects of special relativity. Indeed, this effect was derived using our result for time dilation. Okay, so you know that in order to understand length contraction properly, you also need to be thinking about time dilation. I mean, there's a sense in which uh, length contraction is more confusing than time dilation, because when we talk about length time dilation, we're talking about the length of time between two different events that take place at given uh, uh, positions at a given time. But when we talk about length contraction, you, you're thinking about, for example, the locations of these two mirrors as a function of time. And so um, a mirror is not an event, it's an object that exists for all time. And so you need to be a little careful when you about defining your terms precisely when you say uh, what you mean by length contraction. And I've tried to be it do it precisely here, but of course, uh, we're going to rederive this next class using Lorentz transformations, um, and we'll understand it from a slightly different point of view. There was a question. Maybe not. Good. Okay. Um, I should take a moment to discuss, uh, at least very briefly, um, the experimental evidence for special relativity. So... Of course, the uh, effects that I've described today are um, pretty uh, outrageous, and it would be uh, correct of you uh, and conservative of you to be a bit skeptical. And so what I just want to mention today is that there is an outstanding amount of evidence for the theory of special relativity, both direct and indirect, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention to you perhaps the most famous experiment which confirmed the basic notions of special relativity, which is known as the Michelson-Morley experiment. So let me just describe that to you very briefly. So the Michelson-Morley experiment consisted of a pair of mirrors that were mounted on perpendicular rods. And then a light source was shown on a, a semi-silvered mirror. Okay, I love, it's so cool to talk about semi-silvered mirrors, which split the light in uh, two perpendicular directions so that they both bounced off the two mirrors and then came back and recombined and were projected onto some sort of screen. And these two uh, uh, light beams will interfere when they come together at the screen. And by studying the interference pattern, you can understand the relative distance traveled by these two beams of light. And in particular, any change in light travel time will lead to a change in the interference pattern. And so the Michelson-Morley experiment was a very simple one. They just used the fact that the Earth is in motion around the sun, and so moving with some large velocity, 30 kilometers per second. And so if the speed of light depended on the reference frame in which it was measured, one should be able to perform this experiment, obtain one result for the interference pattern, and then wait six months 
and obtain a different result for the interference pattern. Or if you're not interested in waiting for six months, you could just rotate this experiment by some angle. You could just rotate it by some angle relative to the direction of the Earth's propagation through the solar system, and the interference pattern should change. And what Michelson and Morley observed is that the interference pattern did not change, implying that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames. So there's actually uh, an interesting historical story here. So the Michelson-Morley experiment was actually done um, before Einstein published his papers on special relativity. But as far as we know, Einstein didn't actually know about it. So as I reviewed last class, one can actually um, conclude that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames simply based on the Maxwell equations, which of course had been known since the late 19th century. And um, the Michelson-Morley experiment was, in a sense, only a confirmation of that theoretical prediction. And Einstein actually hadn't even heard about the Michael Michelson-Morley experiment at the time that he developed the theory of special relativity. Although, um, I think it's fairly safe to say uh, that if he had heard about it, that would have only made him more sure of uh, his results. Um, the other results, so this Michelson-Morley experiment is a test of the basic postulate of special relativity, that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames. But the various consequences that I have derived today have also been measured experimentally. So time dilation has been measured uh, directly, uh, literally by flying a clock up on a satellite or uh, even in an airplane, and uh, comparing the results of that clock to uh, those which we would see on Earth. Uh, so I forget the exact numbers, but the, uh, an astronaut who's flying up into space uh, will return to Earth slightly younger than an astronaut who's been sitting here on the Earth's surface. Um, not enough to matter very much from a practical point of view, but enough that can be measured uh, by an atomic clock. Uh, yes, question. Um, well, like I said, uh, an astronaut in space would actually be younger than an astronaut in Earth. But then from this point of view, uh, Earth would actually be yeah. moving and then should we also not go down to... That's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, you've just articulated a form of the twin paradox, Okay, which, just to let me restate, is the confusion that from the point of view of uh, an astronaut up above, it's the astronaut on Earth. I guess he's not an astronaut if he's on Earth. It's the normal guy on Earth who is um, moving. And so that person should be younger. But then when they meet, they really should compare notes. And one of them really is younger than the other. And it turns out that the, this, that, um, the difference between the two comes from the fact that there is an acceleration. So the astronaut who goes up into space and come back, comes back down again is also accelerating. And so one has to take into account the fact that there's acceleration in addition to relative motion. Okay. So, um, so far I've just been discussing uh, constant velocity relative motion, but one can also use special relativity to discuss acceleration, and that's something that we'll do. Okay. Good question. So um, time dilation has been measured uh, directly uh, using clocks, but also indirectly. So, for example, um, it's possible uh, to uh, create an elementary particle which is unstable. So many, uh, most particles and nuclei are unstable in one form or another. And you can measure its lifetime in one frame and compare it to its lifetime in another frame and they will be different. So, uh, for example, on the problem set you'll do next week, you will use this to explain why it is we observe muons on the Earth's surface, because muons are created in the upper atmosphere, okay, many, many kilometers away, but muons also have such a short lifetime that you would not understand how they could ever survive to reach us here on the Earth's surface unless you knew about the effects of time dilation. And uh, indeed, um, Many of the best, most precise tests of special relativity 
come from particle physics, where the effects of relativity are absolutely crucial. So, for example, I just looked this up before class. The Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland will ex accelerate protons to velocities which are 0.9999999991 times the speed of light. So, relativistic effects are uh, not just relevant, but absolutely crucial for anything that we study in particle physics. Now, length contraction has not been measured directly. Because whereas it's easy, relatively speaking, to build an atomic clock, which measures time intervals very carefully, it's rather, so it's very easy to measure changes in time intervals of a part in 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 or something like that. It's very difficult to measure changes in the length of an object to a part in 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9. Instead, length contraction has only been tested indirectly. Again, uh, through particle physics experiments, where, for example, you can imagine colliding two uh, neutrons together or two uh, nuclei together. And in fact, this is an experiment that is done. And because of length contraction, uh, one of the nuclei will appear to be flattened into a pancake from the point of view of the other nuclei. And this flattening leads to important uh, effects when you want to consider this uh, scattering process where two nuclei collide together. So, for example, uh, at Brookhaven, there's an experiment going on where gold nuclei are collided together. And uh, the correct description of this experiment, which matches all of the experimental data, is uh, a description where the gold nuclei are incredibly flat pancakes. Okay, instead of spheres. And uh, without length contraction, uh, we would not be able to correctly reproduce the measurements of this experiment. But I would say this is not a completely direct measurement of length and contraction, at least in uh, the way that one might like. Okay, there's a question. Yes. Is it because if you have two pancakes near each other, the distribution of the momentum is different than two spheres? Um, the distribution of the momentum will be different. The density will be different. If you imagine taking all of the nuclei in a gold, a gold atom, which is a sphere, and squashing it into a really thin pancake, it'll be much denser. Okay. And so the collision properties, the rate at which nuclei will collide with one another, will depend on this length contraction factor. And it's an important and measurable factor. Okay. So... Um, and of course, there are all sorts of other quantities which are tested. So I have described for you the three basic effects of relativity, uh, but there are other sort of effects of special relativity that we will um, explore more in the coming weeks. Uh, for example, there is a relativistic version of the Doppler effect. There is, of course, the relativistic relationship between mass and energy and so on and so forth. And these have all been checked uh, to incredible degrees of uh, accuracy. I mean, for some of these experiments, for example, involving the timing of photons that are sent from quasars uh, a billion light years away, you have absolutely fantastic degrees of accuracy in these experiments. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, and next class, we'll move on to consider um, a bit more uh, abstractly the structure of space and time in special relativity.